We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. Hello and welcome to The Interruption, the Global Institute for Tomorrow podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about a topic that's on everyone's minds, because it's been affecting so many people across the world, working from home. You will have seen the funny videos of people in virtual meetings with interruptions from children, pets, spouses, even falling objects, aka the new inclement weather of work. However, as the lockdown continues in many countries across the world, or even starts again, as it has been in Hong Kong, where we're based, it's worth considering if other more serious stresses arise, particularly on the blurred lines between work and the home. So, Chandran, what is your take on working from home? Do you see it as part of the new normal? Well, perhaps I could start by coining a new phrase and we'll call it work from home sucks. And the reason I, I, I want to be quite pointed about this is... Um, I'm actually doing this podcast because uh, I've spoken to so many uh, leaders of businesses and people who work in companies, etc., who said, could you please do this podcast? Just tell the world it sucks. Uh, because no matter what we do, wherever we listen to what the pandemic has done in terms of influence and the nature of work, especially with media and the tech company advocates of uh, more technology, uh, uh, interfacing with every aspect of our life, it's about the future is work from home. But uh, it conflates uh, the idea of work with essentially what a small segment of the global workforce uh, do, which is white collar workers. And even within that, the privileged few who can work, uh, work from home. Uh, was ignoring, but the inf- but the data seems to be coming out now more clearly after three four months of this dystopian reality of staying at home uh, that most people find it a horrible experience. Um, there's also data that shows that the more senior you are, you seem to like it because then you can boss around the minions and get them to do things on emails and get them to work twenty four seven. So. So I don't think there's such a, I mean, the term new normal too is a sort of a pathetic poor term that we use for everything. What is a new normal? So the new normal for whom? Uh, so, and who benefits from these definitions or even the implementation of these sorts of ideas? So I don't think it's a new normal at all. I think we'll get back to a return, but not to a normal. But there are much more important issues, uh, and I'm trying to write, uh, write about these things, have got nothing to do with working from home. So it's kind of reserved for the white-collar workers, is that, is that right? Yes, and even then, uh, white-collar workers who are either privileged enough that they can do those things, uh, who are antisocial, who don't like coming at home, who like to work in their pyjamas, stay on camp for most of the day, play with dogs and cats, uh, and uh, who don't really want to uh, interact with other people and learn. And I think a very important part of uh, coming to work is the social aspect of work and learning from being with with others. And we can we can talk about those things as well, but it's principally for white collar workers and they don't form the majority of the global workforce. You can't work from home if you grow rice. You can't work from home if you work at the airport uh, essentially making sure that the aeroplanes fly. Um, and those of us who are privileged to take up this option of working from home so easily have forgotten that uh, the streets are kept clean by people who don't have the option of working from home, uh, that the supermarkets are, are, are open because people have no option, and, and need I say healthcare workers, etc. So there's an element of solidarity too in rejecting this idea of work from home. Um, The solidarity of essentially being with the majority Mm. at a time of great uh, great uncertainty, uh, great social sort of um, breakdown, etc. So for me, it's it's all about solidarity. Of course, that doesn't mean we're going to breach any rules. 
when the the medical authorities tell us everyone stay at home. Mm. Yes, but that's not that's because we may have a spike and there are precautions to be taken. But otherwise, you know, societies work because there's solidarity. They increasingly don't work, as we have seen, uh, because we draw a line and give privileges to those of us who think uh, we are above the rest. That's interesting. That sounds like the working from home narrative actually draws a veil across the frontline workers of every society that don't have the option to work from home. It's, it's yeah, so why don't people talk about it? You know, why don't people say it's a kind of apartheid? You know, you guys will do the dirty work and we'll stay at home. Mm. But even within the work from home uh, sort of population, there's other economic divisions which I've said. Uh, I have done a fair amount of work in the last few weeks with different companies and the middle management hated, uh, hated. And let's not forget as well, there used to be the whole mantra about work-life balance. There used to be a, such a thing, uh, that famous saying, don't take your work home. But since we have the internet, it seems like work must be at home. We've all been inundated with this, the, the pressure to address emails up to 6 p.m., etc. But now they're saying 24-7, you will be at home. So this is just a gradual sort of move towards essentially using technology as an instrument of tyranny. So we have no time for ourselves, etc. The other important thing to recognize too is, and we're all already, you know, like lemmings uh, attached to our mobile phones, our emails. You have to be superhuman almost to tear yourself away from this. But now they're asking you to work at home. And one of the things I've heard from so many people is no lunchtime, lunch, lunchtime is mm. out. Uh, dinner, forget it, because there's going to be another uh, zombie Zoom call that you have to. Uh, come on to uh, and we aren't even talking about how useless most meetings are we all know that you know a great percentage of meetings people have are useless uh, they extend people run meetings they can't they can't manage so all of these things you know have essentially distorted the, the com complete sort of uh, social fabric and let's not forget most people don't have an office at home. So the people who talk about this uh, work from home are those people who have, you know, 10 bedrooms or five. Uh, they have an office, you know, um, the maid sleeps in the kitchen. Uh, they, they have all of those things and they think that's how it is. But I, I read something recently that suggested that uh, in the survey done by one of the uh, one of the property companies in the world, I think it was a lot out of, of Europe, uh, and this is in Europe, and it suggested that um, only 20% of the so-called work-from-home population uh, have what would be termed uh, a home office. Right? Mm. Let's face it, most of us don't have that. Mm. Uh, I'm privileged, I, I, I have that space, but most people don't. So most people are actually working from their kitchens. Uh, we've seen awful images of people in bedrooms. Uh, <laughs> People have got uh, are so casual with how they present themselves on the Zoom calls. So all that sort of sense of professionalism has gone out of the window. Yeah. But people don't have those spaces. So we're talking about a move into the home space, away from the workspace, and people are becoming more isolated. They're becoming more casual oh, or lax. The mental, the mental stress must be huge. But that's, that's exactly my, my question. What happens when you remove the social element of work, but you increase the hours and availability of work? Oh, you become an antisocial misfit. Uh, don't we already have enough misfits? Uh, people becoming antisocial because of the stresses of work, uh, the stresses of the the electronic age, etc. We've already seen this and now we're going to add that and actually tell them, take it home, don't bring it here. And just uh, become antisocial, stay antisocial with your spouses, your kids, etc. and the dog. Uh, and just be like that. Well, this is extremely dangerous. So I don't see this in any way as the future. I think it might be imposed. I think people will fight back. But let's let's talk about another element of this thing. So if you, your company asks you to go home and says, you know, uh, we're going to give you all the kit, and we've heard this already, they're going to kick you out 
Well, I'm going to want then rent. I want you to pay my rent. And let's go and have a discussion about that. Some of the argument is companies will save on the office space rent. Well, fine, then pay me. I'll, uh, I'll see how much it costs because it's not just the space, it's all the other stuff. And let's get some lawyers involved and figure out what's the social cost of essentially getting me to work at home and how much does my salary go up. Uh, that, that would be a fair thing, not to mention electricity bills, uh, air conditioning bills, heating bills, etc. All of those go up. So, you know, this is not even factored into the, into, the, into the discussion. So who's going to pay for that? Uh, and if companies are willing to pay for that, then let's look at how the economics work. Yeah, that's interesting. I think the conversation around organization, the organizational aspect of working from home is one to do with increased efficiency, which is that people don't need to commute. They can work from wherever they want to and, and therefore contribute to the organization better and quicker. I mean, I like your example about how the uh, organization should be paying rent, but do you think that's true? Is there an element of increased productivity from working from home at least? Well, again, there's some stats around, um, and I think uh, just this week the BBC had a little uh, uh, had a little segment in the in the the, the news uh, where they interviewed a few people, and it's interesting. You know, you know, you know what news agencies are doing when you see the type of people they interview and then the responses they give. So I thought I saw the first time a trend that the BBC is beginning to say, hmm, most people are saying work from home sucks because they interviewed five people and said, I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like it because they finally found out what loneliness looks like. And most of us want to leave home uh, to run away, get away from a spouse or family or something, at least for half a day, you know, I mean, give me a break. Uh, and go meet some other people and learn. And I think the learning aspect is really important. So there is the isolation, etc. So yes, uh, you can make the argument about commuting times, etc. But let's make our cities better. Let's make our cities design more proper, uh, more uh, well designed. Uh, and um, let's make public transport the means by which people get to work. But there's no running away from the fact that uh, the social interaction is a big plus of essentially going to work. But the point I like to stress though is, really, so much of this discussion forgets that the majority of people do not have an option of working from home. Their job is not logging onto the internet and essentially, um, you know, writing emails, making phone calls, they have a huge amount of other things to do. And I'm not talking even about blue collar workers, I'm talking about all those other people who provide services which, which constitute uh, a key, uh, key services to the rest of us. And for, so I will go back to, you know, uh, try, try, tell, try getting the people who grow your food to work from home. Uh, those things really matter. Yeah, I think this speaks to a deeper issue. I mean, let's just take Hong Kong, for example. We are working in Hong Kong at the moment. In 2000, 20% of Hong Kong had access to internet. Now in 2020, it's virtually 100%. Yes. And the pandemic seems to have cast a lens on the divide then between the people who use the internet for their day-to-day -day work and those who do not seems to pull the rift between the people, as you mentioned, who clean the streets and the people who work in the towering office blocks, right? So... How do we reconcile that then going forward? We have this narrative about working from home, but how do we actually use it for the advantage of both of these parties? Why do you need to have... Uh, the internet is not supposed to essentially... Uh, it, you know, it's not this panacea that is made up. They can solve every problem. It can't. So why do we try to f struggle to find arguments to say, how can it benefit everyone? Well, it doesn't benefit most people. For most people, it's probably a tool that gives them a bit of entertainment, uh, waste time, perhaps some bit of social interaction, etc. But it doesn't enhance their quality of life from the point of view of productivity, not at all. So the real point is that uh, for those people, uh, it's not an instrument for work. If you're a chef, the internet's got nothing to do with going to the market, buying the food, cooking in a hot kitchen, 
uh, managing all the hygiene, etc. It's got nothing to do with that, right? And most jobs have got nothing to do with the internet on a daily basis. So it tends to be those of us, and that's how, you know, again, coming back to this idea, coming back to the phenomena of we get sucked into the echo chambers of defining how the world works based on uh, our own uh, self-serving worldview. Yeah. So the self-serving worldview of the white collar worker is that uh, the internet uh, rules everything and does everything. It doesn't. So you have to free ourselves mm. from this notion. For most people, it's got nothing to do with their work. It's some kind of maybe it's, has some social benefits. I would argue a lot of times it's just wasting time, but it's got nothing to do. So we shouldn't kind of force this thing. But there is a divide, and that divide is an economic divide. It's got nothing to do with the internet. And that's what, in a city like Hong Kong, the divide is not about working from home who can't work from home. It's essentially the social inequality that results in people living in poorer conditions. Um, if they don't break through a certain uh, you know, economic scale. Yeah, that, that's interesting. We've gone quite deep there and <laughs> slightly away from the, the topic of working from home. So I'll bring it back and I'll say, for those of us who are returning to the office, what would you recommend for them? What would you say is the way to navigate the, the re-socialization of people once they've come back from learning how to use Zoom and everything, back into the office, back to socializing? What is a good way to navigate that from a, from a managerial perspective? Well, you know, uh, I mean, I can speak from, uh, from my, my own position here. Uh, you will know that we made a decision uh, taking into consideration all the advice from the government uh, because Hong Kong has, has not had a lockdown, and taking all the advice from the government, uh, watching very closely, and we decided that it was not in our interest, and I can say from the point of view of being the head of this organization, I felt it was not in the interest of people's long-term development to stay at home for potentially four to six months. I really felt this was not good. But at the same time, I was going to be ultra-cautious to make sure, and that's my responsibility, that no one was at risk. And therefore, we looked to the government for good, solid advice. So I took that decision, and I like to think everyone here feels that was a good decision. We had to reshape our whole business, for the, and that could not have been done through Zoom calls and the huge inefficiency, and all everyone here having to work uh, in or, you know, uh, countless hours, which I would never want to promote. So for us, that was very clear. So now for those who've been out there, etc., I don't want to overstate it. I think people are social animals. Come back, suck it up, you know, hug someone, uh, <laughs> and go out for lunch, and things will, um, things will return to essentially the sort of social uh, socialization norms that we should all as human beings be part of. That's in our DNA to be social animals. I mean, you have to be pretty messed up to have lost it in four months. But, you know, if you have, uh, I suggest go on a long holiday, uh, go and do something, play some sports, etc., and meet some people. But for, uh, for everyone else, I don't see this as a huge problem. What I do see as a problem at the moment is the stress that people are feeling with essentially being cooped up in a, in a flat. And depending on where you live, how privileged you are, it can be very, very stressful. In an urban um, vertical city like Hong Kong, uh, that's very stressful. Mm. Uh, and I, I really feel too, very strongly, that there is a real tension now, and I'm no medical expert, about kids as well. You know, so uh, going to school, etc. That's a, that's a that's a debate that's being played out by health experts, etc. But it's not good. Uh, I know from the experience of uh, parents I know here and children that the stresses in the family of you know teaching at home and etc. have been have been very significant. So I think uh, the re the return is to essentially how we manage our schools and our workplaces. But more importantly, rethinking our economic models and essentially the, 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 the big rethink is not about work from home. It's other more fundamental issues, which I think we can address um, in the next podcast. 
uh, I'd like to talk in the next po podcast about the 10 things that must change in the world. And it's got nothing to do with work from home. Great. Well, that is a bombshell to end on, Chandra. And I think this has been a really interesting talk. We've started off talking about working from home and ended up talking about economic development and divides between sets of society. So thank you. That's all we have time for, unfortunately, though. So we hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of The Interruption. And if you're interested in GIFT, you can find us at www.global-inst.com. Good health to everyone tuning in. Thank you. Thank you. We return you now to your regularly scheduled program. No, sir.